The power in place is often rooted in community, and it is wonderful to see so many of you here now. And for our guests, welcome. You are now officially members of the extended Bunker Hill Community College family. Gwendolyn Brooks talked about the power of community in her poem about Paul Robeson, and she described it this way. We are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. So thank you all for being here with us today as we delve into what is a complex, difficult, beautiful conversation on how we can create more equitable institutions that value the cultural wealth of our students, faculty, staff, and communities. I would like to ask one more group to stand, one, a very important group. If you are a member of the Center for Equity and Cultural Wealth Institute Design Team, please stand. Please join me in giving a round of applause to this group. This team has worked tirelessly over the past several months to put together a thoughtful and meaningful program focused on bringing us together in reflection, to share and reimagine all the ways that we can work together toward more inclusive and equitable learning environments. So thank you for your time on the team this spring. Now that we've focused on who is in the room in terms of place, let's talk a little bit about the place where we're standing, Bunker Hill Community College in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Charlestown was called Mishawam by the Massachusetts tribe, and in their own words, although they were devastated by European illness, settlement, and displacement, against all odds, have survived as a people. Ritual dance, drum, rattle, song, and rites of passage all enable the present day Massachusetts tribe to transfer the knowledge of our ancestors to succeeding generations. And we are grateful for that knowledge in a place called Mishwam here today. Charlestown was incorporated in 1628, named for Charles I of England, and was the first capital of the Massachusetts Bay Colony also the site of the Battle of Bunker Hill right down the road. 20 years after the Battle of Bunker Hill, the land that Bunker Hill Community College is built on was the home of the Charlestown State Prison, which was built in 1805, and just before it was torn down in 1957, it was home to inmate number 22843, also known as Malcolm X, who did a lot of his writing from this place. We are grateful for his presence with us here today. The next building to live on this peninsula was Bunker Hill Community College, which was opened in 1973 and just celebrated its 45th anniversary. This place, where we are all sitting, is home now to the most diverse student body in the continental United States, and we are very proud of our cultural wealth and the values and assets our students, faculty, staff, and community members bring into our campus each year. Last week, this gym held students lined up on their way to graduation. And on Thursday, May 23rd, 1,754 degrees and certificates were awarded to the class of 2019 at our 45th commencement exercise. In short, on behalf of the Center for Equity and Cultural Wealth, welcome. We are glad you are here. This team has worked tirelessly and we are ready to begin a celebration of that hard work with deep thought and deep community and reflection on power and place with you. So please join me in a round of applause for the captains of our institute, the 2019 Institute Design Co-Chairs, Evans Aurelius and Carla Santa Maria. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us for what we feel will be a fantastic institute. Um, the institute is that of a three-day model. So giving you an overview. Day one of the institute is focused on foundational concepts related to power and place and making connections between and among equity, cultural wealth, and student success. Activities are designed to engage participants in critical discussion about whose cultural wealth is valued in higher education and the ways in which colleges have produced and reproduced inequities that impact student success. 
Day two of the Institute is focused on power and place in the community through experiential and place-based teaching, learning, and student development. Central to this exploration is a critical dialogue about the stories that are and are not being told about our local communities. The opening address and field study activities are designed to enable participants to engage with greater Boston neighborhoods and the organizations and institutions working to recognize and amplify community cultural wealth and or disrupt inequities. Day three of the Institute is focused on designing teaching, learning, and workspaces that consider power in place. Examples of the ways in which faculty and staff are enacting equity-minded principles, valuing cultural wealth, engaging in team building, and leadership development will be highlighted. Inquiry-based activities and showcases are designed to engage participants in two questions. What do we know about building equitable and inclusive teaching, learning, and working environments? What more do we need to know to deepen our practice? Just a couple of announcements before I pass this over to Carla. Um, you'll see table tennis on the table. Um, please, throughout the Institute, we want that all-encompassing holistic experience and interaction. So if you see something, you are comfortable with it, um, please feel free to use the hashtag via your social media. Um, that's B-H-C-C-C-E-C-W. Again, please feel free to share your experiences by using the hashtag B-H-C-C-C-E-C-W. Additionally, an announcement was made earlier about field study information. All of you have been assigned to a field study. In the event that you are still unclear about that, please feel free to see Clea Andrealis in the back, and she's more than, help, more than happy to get you sorted out. With that, I'd like to defer to Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Evans. Um, the Bunker Hill Community College Artist in Residence program began last year, and that work will be integrated through the Institute. Last year, our Artist in Residence was Dr. Robin Chandler, and she kicked off the program by providing programming and dialogue opportunities through the 2018-2019 academic year. This year, I mean, I want to thank you, Dr. Chandler, for that. I know she's not here today, but we want to thank you for her. Want to thank her for that. Now, this year, our artist in residence is Ms. Rina Espaillat. She has published books, three chapbooks, and most recently, a poetry collection titled "And After All." Her work comprises poetry, essays, and short stories in both English and Spanish. She has received many national awards and international awards, including the Richard Wilbur Award, the Nemerov Prize, the Elliott Prize, and several awards from the New England Club and various honors from the Dominican Republic Ministry of Culture. Please welcome Ms. Rina Espaillat. <laughs> Everybody is taller than I am. <laughs> thank you very much for the lovely introduction, and thank you most of all for inviting me to be here. I love this place. I love this place because everybody in it is smiling, and the audience here consists of people who feel like family. Not only are many of you uh, educators, but also immigrants like me, people who think in two or more languages, like my, my mon frère, Jean Dany, who thinks in several. And uh, in other words, I, I'm home. So thank you very much for inviting me to become part of this institution for a while anyway. I'm going to read an opening poem, and I'm, I'm ch I chose this particular one because it's about education. It's about being a foreigner in a new country about finding your way in that country, which is not easy, as, as many of you know. And it's about how it takes an imaginative teacher, a good, empathetic, imaginative teacher who knows the ropes, who knows how to talk to people, to help students do that, to help students make that transition from one culture, one language, one way of living, one society, to another. This poem is called Crayons, and it has a dedication for Miss Conroy, late of PS 94. I'm speaking of PS 94 on Amsterdam Avenue in New York City, 68th Street. 
And I'm thinking back now to 1940, 1941, back in the dawn of history. Uh, and and I, was, I was there in her class, just learning English, still not great at it, still feeling my way, because Spanish, of course, is my second language. I'm from the Dominican Republic. And this Miss Conroy sort of saved my life because she knew enough to do many things right. First of all, before she started teaching me things, she asked me to teach her things. She asked me for information, and that caught me immediately. It was a hook, and I think that those of us who teach should remember that. The second thing she did was to avoid using language exclusively. She, learned, she used other things to invite me into my new life. What she did was magical. She took a huge roll of paper. Does anybody here remember the name Oak Tag? Okay, so I'm not the only oldie here then. She took this enormous roll of Oak Tag and rolled it out on the back of the classroom and put tacks in it so it would, it would stand up. And then she said, well now we're going to use that later, but first I want you to draw me on this piece of paper something that you remember. And I had never been asked to do that. So I knew that the windows were covered with, with uh, turkeys and with pumpkins because it was November. But I didn't know anything about that. I had never heard of Thanksgiving. So I gave her my narrative instead of the one that was all over the room. I gave her my farewell to my family in the DR. I was on a boat. It, this is my picture. I was on a boat in very badly drawn water, and she had given me a whole box of crayons to keep. I didn't have that, so I was impressed. And she said, all right, um, draw. So I drew my family on the shore of Santo Domingo doing this, and I was on the boat, and the water was shaking the boat up and down, and I was on it waving goodbye. So this is for Miss Conroy, late of PS 94, and it's called Crayons. When the child learning English joined your class, you gave her crayons, a whole box to keep, and said, now draw me something you remember. Windows were trimmed, it was early November, with toothy pumpkins. What your student drew, though, was her narrative. Figures afloat on spikes of parrot green, meant to be grass, waved out to one lone figure on a boat, tilting, precarious, in a royal of blue, meant to be sky and sea, both very deep. The next day, Miss Conroy, you unrolled, laid out, and tacked up on the bare back wall eight yards of oak tag. From the far left end, each artist worked. History would unfold there every morning. Early, day by day, first pilgrims landing, done in shades of gray, weather, weapons, clothes, the rock itself. All equally severe. Then, to befriend those somber strangers, others, bravely red and brightly feathered, above words you said to print in colors. Welcome and homestead, sowing and harvest, hunting, hut and fish. In memory, the scripted scenes are clear. Arrows in flight pass safely overhead, missing the settler, bringing down the deer, crops in the field, rendered in tan and gold to feed the worker, farmer, soldier, priest. Nobody dies except the very old. Even the smiling turkey on its dish wears a corsage of carrots to the feast. What simple tales we learned early from you who loved perhaps even believed them, though your own immigrant forebears found them less than true. Your name, like mine, rang with departures, roots severed, replanted here in fields of stone, 
less welcoming than crayons made them seem. Homelands are not acquired by pure dream. They may be stolen and their crops denied to owners and to slaves who tend their fruits, whose claims are honored after they have died, if ever, and whose names the years erase. How tempting, Miss Conroy, to include, though late, their portraits in our wistful view, if only out of shame or gratitude. But let their absence say, we haven't run, only crept at a slow, uneven pace toward justice. Let it say we're not yet done with your assignment, work we pledged to do. And her assignment, of course, was to become part of this new country that we were just learning to live in and to make it, after we were through living here, a little bit better than we found it. So that's my poem. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. With that, we'd like to introduce uh, President Pam Edner. Thank you, Rena, for that lovely poem. Um, Rena is our second artist in residence at Bunker Hill Community College. It is an initiative that we started last year, and we hope to um, be informed and inspired by you this year, Rena. And in the second annual institute of the Center for Equity and Cultural Wealth, we too hope that we're crawling, creeping unevenly towards justice. So it is really my pleasure today um, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Sean Harper. Dr. Sean Harper is a national researcher and scholar on race and gender and he has informed and transformed the conversations about equity in many, many places in education and in the corporate space. At a day and age when public intellectuals are few and their voices are dampened, Dr. Harper's insistent discourse on the racialization of our institutions and the, t and the context it provides for our actions and of, and of our work is of great value to us. Dr. Harper is the Provost Professor in the Rossi School of Education and the Marshall School of Business at USC. He's publishing his 13th book entitled Race Matters in College. Today, Dr. Harper's presentation will provide context and a guiding voice for us for the next three days of learning and reflection. Please help me welcome Dr. Sean Harper. Good morning. Great to see you all. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction and more importantly for the extraordinary leadership that you provide to this important place in higher education. I love that the theme of the next three days is around power and place. Um, and I really admire a president who uses her power and platform to elevate a place and to widen opportunities uh, and to make the place more inclusive, which I know for sure that you're doing here. So thank you. And thank you, Leah, and others who were responsible for uh, getting me here. I am going to get us started because I want us to end on time. I don't want to deprive you of a break between um, this morning session and uh, the next set of sessions. Um, let me just say that I am going to start in a seemingly random place, but just hang with me. This will all come together. It will be very clear to you where I'm going. Um, but I'm actually going to start with um, a clip from a movie that I saw when I was 10 years old. Um, in hindsight, this is probably not an appropriate movie for a 10-year-old. 
I don't know what my mom and her sisters were thinking when they took me to the theater to see The Color Purple. Um, I saw The Color Purple, uh, the musical version of it on Broadway uh, a couple years ago, and it inspired me to actually go back and rewatch the original film. I had read Alice Walker's book. Um, obviously, the film was an adaptation of, of Walker's uh, incredible book. But when I, when I went back and I, and I rewatched the film, um, it was striking to me how much of it I had recalled from when I was just 10 years old. Um, I remembered, in fact, just about every scene in, in, in the movie. There were two of my favorite scenes. I picked one of them for today. Um, I did not pick the one where Oprah Winfrey, in her masterful uh, performance, you know, said, all my life I had to fight. Um, I could have picked that one, uh, because I am, in fact, a fighter, a person who fights white supremacy and racial injustice and gender violence and homophobia and Islamophobia and other kinds of things. Uh, I find myself in the boxing ring with those things on a daily basis in the work that we do at the USC Race and Equity Center. But instead, I picked this other scene. Um, and it's near the end of the movie. OK, so spoiler alert. If you hadn't seen this movie from 1985, um, I'm going to tell you how it ends. It ends with a woman who has been just so heartbreakingly abused by her husband. And near the end of the film, she, she finds power and agency, and she finds a voice, and she stands up to her abuser. Um, even as she's standing up to him, he attempts to abuse her just one last time, right? So that's where I'm going to start, and I'm going to build on that and help you sort of understand how I think about this in the context of race and racial equity um, in higher education. Um, before I play the clip, I just want to uh, call to your attention that I simply titled uh, my address here this morning, Until. Okay, so in case you couldn't hear, Miss Seeley says to her abusive husband as she's leaving, until you do right by me, everything that you think about is going to fail. Until you do right by me, everything you think about is going to fail. I'm thinking about this um, in the context of race and higher education. Until we do right by students of color, everything that we think about in the name of equity is going to fail. Now, in the remaining moments that we have here uh, this morning, I'm going to try to lay out um, what I mean by doing right by students of color. Black students, Latinx students, Asian American and Pacific Islander students, Native American students, multiracial students, those whom we chronically underserve in American higher education, right? Um, you may have noticed that equity is in vogue right now. It's so on trend. So many colleges and universities and cultural organizations and foundations are abuzz about equity. But it's not clear to me that there is a shared understanding among those who have committed themselves so publicly to the notion of equity. It's not clear to me that they understand what that means. Mine is a fairly clear and perhaps seemingly a simplistic view of this, right? I think that it's about doing right by people, right? It's about giving people what they need to thrive and succeed. I think we have to be more precise 
in our conversations about equity. Are we talking gender equity? Are we talking economic, socioeconomic equity? Or are we talking racial equity? In my work, I call for a specific naming of the equity project that we are undertaking. Um, a lot of times it's more comfortable for teams and groups of colleagues and departments and faculty members in those departments to talk in an abstract way about, about equity or to talk even about gaps. Well, which gaps are we talking about? Which groups of students are most underserved in those gaps that we're measuring and talking about in a raceless way? So as we move forward, you know, I'm going to talk specifically about racial equity with the real stance here that until we do right by students of color, everything we think about in the name of equity is going to fail. Last September, we published a report card, a 50 state report card from the USC Race and Equity Center, which was an analysis of four equity indicators for black undergraduates at every public four-year college and university in the country. We are now hard at work at a community college uh, version of this report that we'll be releasing later this year. One of the things that we did in the report is that we graded every college and university four-year um, in the country on four access and equity indicators. This will likely not surprise you. Uh, when we looked across the 50 states, Massachusetts was highest in comparison to the other 49 states, right? Now, I want to offer, uh, on the one hand, um, gratitude for the important work that you do here in the Commonwealth um, and the ways in which you lead the nation on numerous educational uh, benchmarks, both in K-12 and in post-secondary education. But on the other hand, I want to offer a cautionary note, right? In the report card, our grading was like a literal grading. Um, we used A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. And we awarded to each of the institutions an equity index score, which was just really like a fancy academically, seemingly academically appropriate version of a GPA. Now, with Massachusetts leading the nation, it's leading the nation with a high C. I think that we can agree that we don't want to lead with a high C, right? We would like to serve all of our students well. Even though this particular report card is on black students, I am guessing that the condition for Latinx students is not drastically better, right? Um, one of the things that happened with this report is that there were lots of four-year colleges here in Massachusetts congratulating themselves, doing lots of press interviews. In fact, journalists were doing a thing that like really annoyed me, um, where they would say, this particular college is the best for black students in the country. I'm like, wait, now the report card didn't quite say that in that way, right? It did say that there are not these sweeping gaps on these four indicators for black undergraduate students. But never did we make the claim, my co-author and me, that these were the best places in the country for black students. But it was a storyline for the institutions. One of the things that happened that actually made me quite happy is that many black students here in Massachusetts and in the other so-called high-performing states were saying in their interviews with the press, I don't care what that report says from USC about equity for me and us. This place doesn't feel like one of the best places in the country or one of the best places in the Commonwealth for me and us, right? These students were saying, until this campus does right by me experientially, 
it can't claim to be one of the best in the country. The photo that you see on the screen is not a random one. It's from one of the state colleges here in Massachusetts where there was a, a protest um, last year about um, some, some hate messages and uh, racial epithets that were spray painted across campus and distributed in flyers and in other ways across the campus. And you know, essentially, these students were saying, until our campus does something not just about the seemingly random acts of racial violence, but the everydayness of racial violence, it can't claim to be one of the best in the Commonwealth or in the country. until race is explicitly named in our racial equity work, in our racial equity projects. We're going nowhere fast on closing gaps between different, different racial and ethnic groups. In fact, I would argue that as Massachusetts is becoming increasingly brown, um, and as the numbers of students of color are increasing in terms of post-secondary enrollments, if we don't talk explicitly about race and racism and structural racism and racist institutional policies and practices and cultural norms and approaches to teaching and learning, that the gaps that we see in student performance and attainment are actually going to increase they're going to worsen until we get more serious about talking about race. I'm going to say a bit more about that in a bit. Until campus racial climate is systematically and strategically assessed, systematically and strategically assessed and addressed, we're going to continue to see racial inequities on our campuses. Let me tell you and show you actually uh, how we're thinking about this in our work at the USC Race and Equity Center and what we're doing to help campus leaders and faculty members and boards and others learn the truth about the condition of race on their campuses and also equipping them with data and information to better serve their students and to truly create equitable and inclusive campus climates. The National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climate, also known as the NAC, is a quantitative survey that will be administered annually at hundreds of participating colleges and universities across the United States. Through the NAC, thousands, perhaps millions, college students will offer useful insights into the realities and complexities of race in higher education. NAC respondents will help us understand how various populations differently experience the colleges and universities they attend, where and what they learn about race, their feelings of preparedness for citizenship in a racially diverse democracy after college, and how racial issues in our broader society affect interactions and experiences on campus. The USC Race and Equity Center will help institutional leaders use NAC survey results to improve racial climate, college experiences, and student outcomes. Definitely there are a lot of microaggressions that students of color go through every day. There have also been serious incidences where swastikas were drawn on doors and messages like make America great again, and Hitler, graffiti was present throughout campus. While these issues do exist, I strongly believe that with the constant support of university administration and students together, we can succeed in the long term. We launched this national survey a year ago for colleges and universities uh, across the country. It really builds on, for us, 15 years of qualitative campus racial climate studies that we've done on college and university campuses all across the country, um, both community colleges and a range of four-year institution types. I 
say of our qualitative climate work that it literally has taken us from Princeton University to Portland Community College and several dozen places in between in terms of geography, size, and institution type. In fact, we had done that work at 52 institutions um, in different regions, and it entailed going to a place and spending three to four days doing what felt like seemingly nonstop focus group interviews with students of color, faculty and staff of color, as well as their white counterparts. Our qualitative campus climate work um, ultimately entailed more than 10,000 interviews or interviews rather with more than 10,000 uh, people on those campuses where we were trying to understand the extent to which people were interacting across race, uh, their encounters with racial stress and racism and racist uh, occurrences on the campuses, where and what they were learning about race, so on and so forth. We used all of what we learned over those 15 years to develop this National Climate Survey uh, that we administered this year to more than a quarter million college students at community colleges and four-year institutions across the country. It is in this way that we are attempting to help institutions better understand the realities of race on campus. Um, again, I want to underscore the point that I made earlier about until we systematically assess the climate and strategically address it, we're not moving anywhere fast on racial equity. What I mean is that on many of the campuses, in fact, all but one, where we had done the qualitative climate work over the 15 years, literally on all but one campus, one or more black students have been called the N-word. Students would share with us these heartbreaking examples of you know, other racially derogatory things that were said to them by their faculty members, by their peers, right? Their encounters with racial epithets all across the campuses. Asian American and Pacific Islander students would talk with us about the persistent, their persistent erasure on the campuses. Whenever there was a conversation about race, it was not inclusive of them. Black, Latinx, AAPI, and Native American students would talk about the curricular erasure meaning not reading about themselves and encountering their own cultural histories in classrooms, in class conversations, and texts that were assigned to them by their faculty members, so on and so forth. Those things contributed to their lack of academic engagement and ultimately their academic underperformance. Until leaders and faculty members become more racially literate and more highly skilled, we're going nowhere fast on equity. Perhaps some comic relief um, might be useful here. So let's take a look at one of my favorite now 20-second uh, uh, television commercials. When it comes to racial equity and student success, just okay, it's not okay. Cultural competence has been a buzzword in higher education now for more than a decade. Um, I love, in fact, that you have a center here that focuses on cultural wealth, right? I think that that is a more appropriate framing for this space and time 
But let me say a word about cultural competence. When I moved to Los Angeles from Philadelphia two years ago, one of the things that was at the top of my list was to find a physician, you know, men of a certain age. Um, I want to take good care of myself, right? As I was looking for a new doctor in LA, I wasn't looking for one who was merely competent. I wanted one who was highly skilled, one who has stayed on the cutting edge of her profession, one who continues to read things about medicine and about health and wellness beyond the things that she read when she was in medical school. That's how I think about the importance of moving beyond cultural competence among faculty members and among people who work with students on a campus. Competence is such a minimum standard. Do we not, in fact, want those who interact with our students to be more highly skilled? High skill is what it is going to take to move the needle on racial equity, not mere competence. Mere competence is going to, at the very minimum, keep us where we are. But again, as I suggested earlier, as our campuses become more increasingly diverse, I think that mere competence is going to exacerbate inequity. At the USC Race and Equity Center, we have a series that we call the USC Equity Institutes, in which we teach higher education leaders and faculty members things that they never learned anywhere else in their educational and professional upbringing about race. Our stance is very clear and unapologetic at the center. You cannot do racial equity if you don't know how to talk about race and if you don't, in fact, remediate the things that you never learned anywhere else in your educational upbringing about race. Uh, so we do these through a series of 90-minute uh, virtual modules uh, that we offer to campuses over eight consecutive weeks um, to cohorts of 20 colleagues on a single campus. Each of those uh, virtual modules is 90 minutes uh, once a week over the eight weeks for the group of uh, 20. Uh, there are 35 learning modules on the menu for the equity institutes that range from implicit bias to um, leading in moments of racial crisis on a campus. What do you do, for instance, if tiki torch carrying white nationalists show up on your campus? Or if we see more of what we've seen on the state college campuses here across Massachusetts, where uh, people are showing up with racist propaganda. Those are not things that many leaders have ever thought about or ever learned how to address or confront. We teach those things uh, through these institutes. Uh, the last thing that we do is um, there are 62 expert instructors who teach with us, uh, people who really know um, a lot about each of these various topic areas and the learning modules. But one last thing that we do is that we have the group of 20 work on four strategic racial equity projects. Until we get more strategic in our equity work, we're going nowhere fast on equity. What I mean by that is that a typical approach, and listen, no shade, I like spent a lot of time on the website uh, for the center here. It's fabulous, it's very meaningful work. This is not a dig um, at all. But on most campuses, present company excluded, people think, oh, if we have a day-long summit or a two-day conference on equity, we've done something. Or if we have a speaker series where we talk about equity, say, three times a year, we're doing something. Or if we have a cultural center for Latinx students and we give some resources to that cultural center, that's going to do something, right? 
those are all important programmatic activities, but until they become a part of the everyday cultural functioning of the institution, we're going nowhere fast on equity. Until we do something to remediate the skills of faculty members, right? Like we could do all of these things with and for students to support them outside of the classroom, but if they still have to go back into a classroom that's racist or interact with an instructor who has all sorts of biases and assumptions and low expectations of students from that particular racial group, we've not done enough in a strategic fashion to move the needle on equity. Just a couple more here, a couple more untils. Until the racial stratification in the workforce is dealt with, we are going to continue to contradict ourselves on equity. Ever noticed, perhaps this is the case here, it certainly is the case on just about every other community college campus and four-year college and university campus in the country. Perhaps yours is different. But have you ever noticed in most places that there actually is racial diversity in the workforce? The people cutting the grass, sweeping the floors, frying the french fries in the dining hall, and our colleagues in low-paid secretarial roles, disproportionately are people of color. Let me be very clear that the people who do those important jobs are absolutely deserving of our respect, and we ought to respect them as and appreciate them as humans and as professionals. But the point here, right, is that that's where the diversity tends to be represented in the workforce on many campuses that claim to be so firmly committed to equity. Meanwhile, the president's cabinet, the deans, the full-time faculty, the senate leadership, the academic senate leadership, the leadership of the faculty union, tends to be overwhelmingly white. Even on campuses where students of color are in the majority, which brings me to my next point. Until we create a workforce, a faculty, that more closely matches the demographic makeup of the student body, we are going to continue to chronically underserve our students of color, and we are going to fail on equity. It's paradoxical, as a matter of fact, to suggest or to expect that on a campus or in a context that is browning, if white supremacy is maintained in the composition of the leadership and the faculty, that equity is magically going to be manufactured. It's a paradox. Here's a way that we're thinking about and attempting to help institutions better enact their espoused values concerning equity in the workforce uh, through a, a resource that we've created at the center. We live in a time of tremendous change. By the year 2020, the United States will be more racially and ethnically diverse than ever before. Our local communities are being shaped by new voices and important conversations. They are moving us toward becoming more inclusive. Our campuses are also changing in ways that challenge us to think and see our workforce differently. We ask ourselves, are we ready? What if there was a way to easily identify and recruit highly skilled talent? Racially and ethnically diverse professionals pulled for careers in higher education. What if there was a platform that allowed us to create targeted job postings and establish professional relationships with prospective candidates? And what if that still wasn't enough? What if there were also dynamic resources that could help our institutions better achieve professional equity? What if there was one place to access it all? Now there is. Welcome to prison. About two months ago, our center launched PRISM, 
is what we're calling a racial equity recruiting resource for the higher education workforce. Um, it is through PRISM that colleges and universities um, are finally able to retire the excuse that we just can't find any qualified people of color anywhere to be on our faculty or to be in administrative roles and professional staff roles. Thousands of them are now in PRISM. Uh, they've created profiles. Uh, there are two categories of uh, users in PRISM, members who are highly skilled, highly qualified people of color who either work in higher education as faculty members or administrators, or they're career switching professionals from other industries, um, say people who worked in HR for companies who actually want to bring their skills and talents and experiences to an HR department on a college or university campus. Literally thousands of them are now um, in prison with standardized profiles um, that allow for institutions who are subscribers to post positions, uh, to search for candidates using a series of filters uh, by academic discipline on the faculty side or by role type and position level and years of experience and so on on the administrator and uh, professional staff side. Um, it also allows subscribing institutions to direct message PRISM members who are seemingly a good match for a particular opportunity on the campus. So just in case they didn't see the ad in the Chronicle of Higher Education that week, um, you know, this is a way of very deliberately and strategically getting your position announcement in front of candidates who are people of color uh, who might be a good match. This is just a part of our strategy at the center to provide tools and resources to colleges and universities. Um, you know, I, as I put this together for today, I didn't want this to be an infomercial for the center and its resources and tools, but I did want us to think very critically about what it is that we're trying to do on equity and what it's going to take. I feel very strongly that until we do the things that I've laid out here so far, whether you do them with our tools or not, until we get serious about those things, inequity is going to continue to be an ordinary everyday feature of our campuses. There is just one more, um, one more thing here. So I just talked about having the composition of the faculty and the administration better reflect the student body. Um, I talked earlier about doing right by students of color. But let me just say one more thing here um, that I think is absolutely necessary as we try to move the needle on equity. And I'm gonna go and run back just one last time, this quick clip uh, from The Color Purple to make this point. Now, the last time I highlighted Miss Seeley exercising her agency and her voice, this time I want to highlight the nastiness of her abuser. Even as she's standing up to him in the final moment, you know, he says these like really hateful, very abusive things to her, right? You're black, you're ugly, you're poor, you're a woman. Until faculty and staff of color are treated more respectfully, we're going nowhere fast on racial equity. In our campus climate studies that are focused on faculty and staff, we hear so routinely from faculty and staff of color about the nasty things that their white colleagues say and do to them, 
the ways in which their personhood and, and their scholarship and their contributions to the college are just so routinely diminished and disrespected. These are the same people who make equity possible in the workforce. They make diversity possible in the workforce. We argue in our work at the center that as we work as whole faculties or as whole units in student services and student affairs, as we put together task forces and equity committees and teams and so on, that if those teams are comprised of people who are the abusers of the people of color who are also on those teams, those teams are not going to do their best work. They're not going to create extraordinary results. So much emphasis is understandably placed on increasing the diversity of the faculty. But we also have to do a better job of retaining faculty of color and creating inclusive climates that allow them to do their best work for themselves and for their own careers, but also in support of the students of color whom we seek to empower, retain, and graduate. So again, as you spend the next couple days thinking about power and place, I do want you to have some honest conversations about this place or the place where you work. I also want you to have some honest conversations about who has the power in this place or in your place. I want you to reflect honestly about how that power might be abused or inequitably distributed and who's on the losing end of those power asymmetries. As you talk over the next two and a half or three days about equity, I want you to ask yourself, now what, what kind of equity am I talking about? Is it racial equity? How often do my colleagues and I talk about racism? What do we know factually, empirically, to be the realities of race and the realities of our campus racial climate? Do we fully understand the explanatory undercurrents of the racial gaps and the racial inequities that we see in our student outcomes data? Do we attribute it entirely to, oh, it's because our students come from Boston public schools that have underprepared them for the rigors of post-secondary work? Do we attribute it to poverty that, oh, our students of color come from, disproportionately from lower income families and that's why they're not doing well? Do we attribute it to student effort that, oh, it's because black and Latinx students, particularly males, are apathetic and disengaged and they don't put forth effort in their academics. Have we asked ourselves questions about our teaching practices, our classrooms, our student engagement practices, the ways in which the curriculum that we have constructed erases whole racial groups of people, thereby rendering them intellectually powerless, disengaged, and so on. Until we grapple with those realities, I am afraid that we are going nowhere fast on racial equity. I wish you the very, very best in the work that you have ahead of you. Um, I've looked at the program. It is fabulous. There are lots of great sessions. Um, but I really do hope that you will take those questions that I just gave you um, with you as you go through this program over these next few days. And I want you to keep at the forefront of your consciousness racial equity specifically. Until you do that, I am afraid that 
we're going nowhere fast on racial equity. Hey, thank you. Best wishes to you. time for two questions. Um, if anyone has any, I'm happy to open around with this and allow Dr. Harper to answer those questions. Oh, sure, in the uh, Black Student Report Card. Um, by the way, if you simply did a Google search for black students at public colleges and universities is often the first thing that uh, returns in a Google search is in PDF um, on our center's website. Uh, the four indicators were representation equity. Um, so in it, we compared the um, percent of black students on a campus uh, to the percent of, eight, of, of black residents in, in, in each of the states uh, among 18 to 24 year olds. The second was gender equity. Um, we compared the gap between black women and black men in terms of enrollments to uh, the gap between women and men overall uh, in higher education in the student body. The third was completion equity, in which we simply compare, compare black students' um, six-year graduation rates um, to uh, graduation rates overall at each of the four-year institutions. And the fourth was black student to black faculty ratio. Um, it was there, actually, that we saw like just really just pathetic um, numbers um, and just really like what I think is an inexcusable shortage of black faculty members relative to the enrollment of black undergraduates on uh, each of the campuses. But again, the report is available in PDF at no cost on our center website. One more question? Uh, over here. Um, when you said, when you first introduced the uh, prism comment, uh, con I thought you said prison. Oh. And then I was thinking about that, how that's obviously related to all this. Could you say a few words about that, what's going on in our prisons and how it ties into what you've, you're preaching, so to speak? Yeah, um, so I hate prisons. Um, I think that mass incarceration is especially bad um, and has had devastating effects on my people, um, for sure. Um, you know, I, there are these ways in which institutional actors, as they're attempting to explain particular inequities, you know, they go through a list of these sort of common, taken for granted, explanatory undercurrents. The ones that I named before, the Boston Public Schools, the poverty, the student underperformance and disengagement and all that stuff in prison, they'll be like, oh, we don't have a lot of black male students here because they're all in prison. Uh, false, fake news, um, fake news. My colleague, Ivory Tolson, um, who's a professor at Howard University, just wrote a book, a really important book, in which he debunks with data, not with anecdotes, but with actual statistics, um, several myths about black people, and one of those is that there are more black people in jail than there are in, in college. It's just not true. Women, men, or otherwise, this is not, it's not true. It's also not true that you know, we see such severe shortages and declining enrollments of black students um, in post-secondary education because they're increasingly going off to prison. Um, so yeah, it's just in conversations like, like these, the sort of uh, throwing prison or prison, I've been saying prism a lot, uh, as you can imagine as we've been building this tech tool, 
But um, I just I just find prison to be um, to be an excuse, right, for why we're not doing better on our campuses to enroll more black students, especially. All right, that was that was two. Was that is that good? What if I wanted to do a third though? Okay, I'll answer it quickly. Thank you so much for that third. Um, how would you suggest deconstructing our present education system in respect to the fact of what you're talking about curriculum and how it is not necessarily representing um, what really history or her story really was or is. Yeah, no, great. Um, so listen, I think we have to have a strategy for making the curriculum more culturally responsive and culturally inclusive. It can't simply be an add-on that, oh, we're just gonna sprinkle some readings by some people of color, or we're gonna sprinkle some readings about indigenous peoples um, into the curriculum, and voila, it's suddenly more inclusive. It has to be a real, serious, strategic activity of the faculty. A strange thing happens on faculties. I've been on three in 16 years, three different faculties. Faculty meetings are often spent on tasky kinds of things. They're not often learning communities, learning spaces, spaces for collaboration, intellectual collaboration. I argue that work at the department level uh, with the faculty, uh, that faculty meetings should be spaces where we actually deconstruct and reconstruct the curriculum, um, in which we engage some outsiders who know more than we know, who have expertise that we don't have, to help us make this curriculum more reflective of the students whom the college enrolls. Um, it can't just be one committed faculty member who does it. It can't be just in a diversity course. It really has to be integrated across the curriculum um, in a super strategic kind of way. Uh, that's, that's how I think it ought to be done. Hey, thank you. Best wishes to you um, as you go throughout the uh, next few days. And thanks again for having me.